Two months ago, we sold our home and moved into this old motor home we call Rosie. We spent our first month completely off-grid in Quartzsite, Arizona, fine-tuning all of our equipment and getting all the kinks out. Forward to today, 60 days on the road. High five. We're going to share with you what we did right and what we did wrong. What we love and what we hate about RV life, as well as how we're adapting to it and down here, Dexter. <laughs> And if you're thinking of living this RV life, whether it's full-time or part-time, you're going to want to watch this episode of Roaming with Rosie. I'm Jamie. I'm Linda. This is Dexter. And this is Roaming with Rosie. We've been renovating and traveling in RVs for over 20 years, but this past January we made the huge leap, sold our house, and moved into this 2006 Alpha Sia motorhome. We call her Rosie. She's 40 feet long, and we think she looks like a beluga whale. Now, we've approached this RV life a little bit different than some others, so you may want to watch some of our other videos on how we're approaching this lifestyle. The big decision we made last year was to keep a home that we own, which is why we don't have a newer, more glamorous coach. Instead, we purchased an older, frankly, cheaper RV instead. It's not that old. No, not that old. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> now, we have no idea how long we're going to want to do this, and we don't want to live in an RV with a serious or major illness down the road. Right, and there's a lot of information in our previous episodes about how we made all this possible. And we're going to put a link up here and also one down in the description so you can see what those playlists hold. So what do we think? RV living 60 days in, was it a good idea or a bad idea? Well, let's go over some of the big hurdles and we'll give some scores. We purchased an older 40-foot motorhome to live and travel in. Was this a good idea or a bad idea? We're still... We're still mostly happy with owning an older RV. Jamie can fix most of the stuff, at least the RV portion of the vehicle. But if it wasn't for that, then no, it wouldn't have been such a good idea. Rosie's too old for an RV warranty that would cover a lot of that kind of stuff. Plus, we would be at the mercy of finding an RV shop to make the repairs and having to wait there while the repairs were getting done. Next one, spending our whole first month off-grid in quartzite. Good idea? Or bad idea? I think it was totally a great idea. We had the opportunity to actually mm -hmm. test out all our systems and make sure they were working correctly. And we were surrounded by literally tons of super experienced boondockers. And now we know that we can go as long as we want to off-grid, but if we do this again next year, I want to make sure and pick up a Blue Boy and also a water bladder so that we don't have to move the rig every week to dump the tanks and also fill up on fresh water. But it is still quartzite, and if, if you are expecting anything different than miles and miles and miles of kitty litter, you might be surprised. All right, how about our less planning, winging it type of travel style? Is that working for us or not really? I guess we're learning. It kind of depends <laughs> on where we are in the country. Yeah, you know, we're from the West, and in the West there's so much BLM land that most people who are on the road can find places to camp and stay. You've got it that way in Arizona, in Utah, and New Mexico. But other people tried to tell us it wasn't going to be that easy once we were out of that area. As far as for one-nighters, it's been fine. In Texas, mm -hmm. you can stay 24 hours in a rest stop, and for uh, Walmarts that allow Wally docking, mm -hmm. they've been really easy to find too, and we've also had other RVers staying there as well. Okay guys, we are doing it. We're officially Wally docking. Here we are in Texas at a Walmart and we're not the only ones here which makes me feel a little bit better here I'll show you okay mm -hmm. harvest hosts also have had a lot of availability and their apps really easy to tell you that information but they're not always right on the beaten path or they haven't been on roads that could accommodate our rig like I called ahead on one and they said they had a low-hanging wire in their to their driveway to get in even though they accommodated a 45 foot rig and then another one had branches across the street that they felt might be too low for us 
Yeah, and that's a good thing, and it's good that you called them first instead of just booking it online. Right, I kind of, you have to book it online for a lot of them, but then I just picked up the phone and called them just to make sure. Right. And I know a lot of people really love Harvest Host, like we said, but so far the one night thing seems to be the biggest problem because they're not on the beaten path, and so you go out of your way to get to where they are to visit that winery or that llama farm or whatever and then you also want to see an area because you drove off the beaten path but fuel's five dollars a gallon yeah and we usually travel to about 4 p.m. and then there's some setup time involved and by the time we get set up and all that mm -hmm. the harvest host is usually closed and then it's too late to travel and go see anything and then by the next morning you just have to leave yeah I wish they did two nights or a lot more of them did two nights when we visited the San Juan River Winery in New Mexico, it was great because you could do your one night with your harvest host, but then you could stay additional nights at just $10 a night, and that included electric and water. I really love that place. Great. Now you net it, let everybody know that. Oh. <laughs> Joining Passport America, was this a good idea or a bad idea? Great idea. We have pulled Passport America out of our toolbox so many times already. Yeah, they've been a really good money saver. We've saved 50% on every campsite we've stayed at at participating parks in the last year. Yeah, their website and their app also have trip planning so that you can see when you're headed out where there's participating parks along the route. Now, each of these parks have different policies for the discount, and some are anytime depending on whether they're full or not. Yeah, some are seasonal, some are Monday through Thursday, some are for one night or two nights. But overall, it's still been the best membership that we have. Right. And we also have a link in the description down below on the video. Well, we've already gone into Harvest Host, and we haven't really used it all that much yet. But we're still glad that we grabbed it when, when we did, because it seems like the price goes up almost every year. And whatever that price is when you get it, you're locked into that annually. And if you think you're really going to want to do this, you're going to want to do this uh, as soon as possible. That way you can lock in the current rates. And we also have a 15% discount for you down in the description below. This week really kicked our butt, though. We spontaneously decided that we wanted to go see some nearby towns. And I was able to grab a few nights at a Texas State Park. And I thought it was so easy. Right. And then we wanted to stay longer. And they were booked solid. So then what we tried to do is use Passport America and harvest hose to try and find something in a nearby area. Yeah, we just couldn't make it happen. So then I randomly started calling RV parks and the rates were $80 and up a night. It just wasn't worth it. We also ran into at the state park we were staying at, Tom and Stacy from RV Texas, y'all. Yeah. And they just happened to know everything there is to know about RVing in Texas. Right. They told us they book six months to a year out in order to be able to visit the places that they want to. And they said they wish they could be more spontaneous too, but it would require them to change their next reservation after that and so on and so on. So they just usually most of the time do it, do their trips as they planned. So we're going to spend this weekend planning out our next two months. It's going to be really hard for us. We really enjoy being spontaneous and flexible and last minute. It's going to be hard. How about our internet service and the equipment that we chose? Were they a good selection or a bad selection? Well, we purchased the Full Timers Bundle from Mobile Must Have. At first, it wasn't working at all. And now it's working great. And what it turned out to be was our self-service provider and the plan that we were on. Yeah, Quartzite during the big RV show really goes up in population. Normally during the year, there's three to 4,000 people there. And in the middle of the winter, in January, it can go up to about a million. But we knew that when choosing our system. And generally, our omnidirectional antenna works really well and it finds you the strongest signal. But it also doesn't let you know how many people are actually using that tower. Right. And so that's why we added on the pointing directional antenna, which we can turn and aim towards a tower that isn't being used as much. We just use an app to find it and then we aim it at that. When we didn't get a decent signal with the directional antenna either, we were kind of baffled. So I reached out to Mobile Must Have's customer service, which worked out really well. They really helped us out. And what it turned out to be was the plan that we were on, and we just had to pay Verizon more money. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's what happened. Verizon was jealous and was preventing Mobile Must Have's router from doing its job. Of course, they have to make sure that nobody buys anything 
from anyone, anywhere, except Verizon. And we had a senior plan with them that gave us all the gigs we needed for a lower cost. Unfortunately, that plan did not support that type of router. Meaning, not theirs. So, we had to go on a different plan that was called Pay Them More, and now the router for mobile must-have works just fine. Yeah, now our internet is working great, and we will continue to have our love-hate relationship with Verizon. Yeah, I can't wait till we can kick them to the curb. Next, we purchased most of our equipment, especially the equipment for going off-grid. We purchased it all up front. Was that a good idea or a bad idea? Uh, personally, I think it was a great idea. We wouldn't have been able to boondock for 30 days out in Quartzite without that equipment. And fuel was just starting to, to rise, so if we didn't have that equipment, we wouldn't have to run that generator a lot more at a lot higher cost. We've been super successful at Wally docking because of our solar, but also because of our Lion Energy batteries. We had to run the heater all night one night because it was 40 degrees, and the batteries and everything performed just as we hoped. Yeah, and the Victron equipment has worked out really well, especially the Servo GX. Basically, it monitors how power's coming in from whether it's solar or from the pedestal or also from the generator, and it also lets me know the status of my batteries. I do think it will be, well, we think it will be um, beneficial to go ahead and buy two more solar panels, so when we get the chance to do that, we probably will. They're not that expensive in the grand scheme of things, but we get those batteries for sure charged up before the sun goes down. And with diesel as expensive as it is, we're just sort of looking at where we'll cut costs in the long run. Yeah, and also the RVI braking system for towing the car has worked out really well. Last week I had a serious braking event where a car had pulled in front of me, and when I applied the brakes on the RV, it worked proportionally in the car as well, so it worked out really well. Yeah, he just slammed on those brakes, but nothing felt like that. It just all went together. Right, you can actually feel the brakes engaging in the car, so it wasn't like any pushing or anything like that. It worked out really well. All right, next, RV parks versus dry camping. Which one do we prefer? I think it depends on a lot of things, uh, the cost, the area, and if we need to dump our tanks or not. Right. In New Mexico, it had been stormy and had actually snowed just a few days prior to us getting there. There was a lot of cloud cover, which meant that our solar couldn't charge. And so if we weren't staying at an RV park, we would have had to run our generator because it was so cold at night. And that would have cost a lot of moolah. Right. <laughs> and I think we're more comfortable boondocking uh, with others for safety reasons and others. What I'm really happy about is finding city and county parks that offer camping. There's a lot of them. First, I gotta kinda check out the area to see if it's safe. And again, I feel better when others are there. Yeah, and the other issue is when you're boondocking, a lot of people don't keep their dogs on a leash. And their dog may be fine, for, but for dogs like Dexter, who really, not, really aren't happy with strange dogs running up to them, it just kinda kind of doesn't work. Yeah, it kind of makes it really stressful for us. Um, but I guess we don't really know yet which is our preference, boondocking or RV parks, but we'll let you know soon. So after two months on the road, how is our budget held up? Did we budget accurately or not so much? Well, after the first two months, I'd say yes. The, big, the huge key is that we were debt-free, so that's huge in uh, staying on budget. Yeah, and this is to cover everything from food to fuel costs, things like insurance, memberships, and like service fees like the internet. That includes our camping fees, our entertainment, um, miscellaneous medical costs, <coughs> and all the maintenance for both of our vehicles. We'll go into more detail about that further down the road, probably after about six months. In the meantime, if you need a great example on the details of the cost, of full-time RVing, our friends Brian and Shauna of Life Uninterrupted, they've been on the road for several years now, and they have an episode dedicated to a review of their budget for one year. And that video is called, How Much It Costs to Live in an RV Full-Time. <laughs> and there'll be a link down in the description below. <laughs> Traveling with Dexter, has this been a good idea or a bad idea? We just really didn't have a choice on that one. Right, it's been really tough on him. Yeah, he really liked his home life. He could go in and out of the house with his dog door as he pleased. <laughs> but now he's getting really used to having to go on command yeah. and he also lets us know when he needs to go. 
and CBD has worked out really well for travel days and now we're currently working with a vet uh, to help him with his anxiety. Being flexible is still very important to us but probably not so useful in the whole planning process. And I think we did a pretty good job on budget planning and retrofitting the RV before we hit the road. We would definitely make all those same decisions again. And it's a lot harder than I thought it would be once we hit the road. Um, things you normally do on a day-to-day -day basis in a house just become more of an issue in an RV. Yeah, like using your toilet. It's completely different than it would be in a house. I mean, you don't have to think about it every time, but it isn't the same. Right, and then there's a lot of things you have to do on the road that were just simpler while you're in a house, like doing laundry. And you remember you forgot quarters. And then meanwhile, <laughs> when we pull into a new place, and I'm crossing my fingers that everything's going to work correctly. And meanwhile, Linda's in the RV, like Lucille Ball from the Long Long Trailer, <laughs> making dinner, thinking everything's fantastic. And I'm standing there wondering, why don't we have a long enough hose for the toilet? <laughs> I thought that we would be outside a lot more. Why don't we do this? You do the sewer hookup and I'll make dinner. <laughs> One of our plans is to try to stay a month in each location that we go to. We really get to know an area a lot better. Plus, if you think about um, you lose a day on each end if you're up and moving any great distance. We want to really try to see that location and live there a little bit. Um, maybe we won't ever have a chance to go back there. That sums up our thoughts of being full-timers two months into it. Yeah, it seems like just in the last week, We've grown a lot of confidence and we don't feel like, oh my God, what have we done? Which we did feel quite a bit the first month. Next month, we expect to be boondocking for the whole month and we'll be meeting up with some of our friends. Our experience doing this has shown us that changing your life this drastically is just a process. And that was like the most important thing to keep in mind as we've gotten up to this point where we feel like this is normal now. And to accept those feelings as being completely normal for deciding to live this uh, a non-traditional life. Non -traditional life yeah. right? Hope that this video has been helpful in deciding what your path will look like and that we've given you the confidence to move forward even though others around you may not understand. And we put links down in the description below for all the things that we've shared with you today. And you can support our channel by using those links down below for the things that you need. We only list links to products that we use and we approve of. And it never costs you anything more for using our links, and sometimes we can pass along discounts to you. We would love if you would share Roaming with Rosie with your friends and family. And if you're not yet a subscriber, make sure and hit that subscribe button. And do ring that bell, because that way you'll be notified each time we upload a new video. And make sure to leave a comment, that way you can be part of the conversation. Until next time. We'll see, see ya. ya.